All right, so welcome everyone again to our workshop on decoding information literacy. I am super excited to have you all here today to talk about this topic. Um, my name is Jane Hammonds. I'm an assistant professor in the Ohio State University Libraries. I'm the teaching and learning engagement librarian. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have a, the opportunity in my job to give a lot of workshops and sessions on information literacy related topics. Uh, this is definitely one of my favorite aspects of the job. Um, and I just love the fact that I have a chance to, to talk about these issues with folks that are also interested in talking about these topics. Um, if you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, send me a follow-up email at hammonds.73 at osu.edu, and I'm happy to talk more about these topics with anyone. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to be talking about the decoding the disciplines model uh, and thinking about how we can apply this model specifically to information literacy learning bottlenecks and how we can use this model to support students' ability to move past uh, these learning bottlenecks. And then I'm going to share a bunch of uh, activities and resources related to coding and information literacy uh, that hopefully will be helpful to folks. Um, I did want to take a, a moment to do a really quick overview on uh, information literacy. I know we have a range of folks that are attending today. So we have some librarians, uh, we have instructors, we have graduate students. Uh, so with the wide range of audience that we have, uh, I wanted to give us all, you know, sort of a basic quick foundation on information literacy. Um, you'll notice that I have the word discipline of information literacy in quotes here. Um, and I did that. Uh, so those folks that are in the, the library world uh, may be familiar uh, that there has been an ongoing debate about whether or not information literacy should be considered a discipline. Um, and that's not a debate that has been resolved uh, within the field. Um, but uh, for the purposes of what we are going to be talking about today, um, I think it is helpful to think about information literacy as a type of discipline, um, as uh, you know, a, a field in which there are shared understandings and practices among the folks that are in that particular field. Um, so that's why I have that term in quotation marks, if folks were wondering about that. Uh, so you may not completely agree that information literacy is a discipline, which is totally okay. Um, but I think it is helpful in what we're going to be talking about today to kind of think a little bit about information literacy in that in that context. Um, so I had a, a quick reflection activity here. You don't have to share your responses. You are welcome to if you would like. Um, but to get us started thinking about this idea of information literacy as a discipline that needs to be decoded, uh, I just had a quick little reflection activity. So, you know, think of a, 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 an assignment that students might have, for example, to do a literature review. Um, and you can think, what is a skill that students would need to have in order to be able to complete a literature review? Um, what is an example of a habit or a disposition that students might need that would uh, make it more likely that they're going to be a successful if they have to do a, a, a literature review? Um, and what is a core understanding about research or scholarship or information that students would need to be able to successfully complete this? Um, so again, you can share your responses in the chat if you'd like. Um, just wanted to give everyone a chance to, to think about those questions. So what is a skill students would need? What is a habit or disposition that students would need? Um, and what are things that students would need to understand to be able to do an assignment like this? Uh, so as you think about these questions, you might think, okay, uh, what are some of the skills that students might need? So to be able to do a literature review, uh, a student would need a skill like, uh, you know, being able to find scholarly articles, right? That's an example of a skill that they would need. Um, citation tracing. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, they would need to know, yes, Leo said, find reputable sources. So they need to know what good sources look like, what scholarly sources look like. They need to know how to find them. They need to be able to do citation tracing. Uh, yes, Christine, understanding publication types. Absolutely. Um, they need to know what a literature review looks like in their field. Yep, how to read a peer review article, how to do database searching. Yeah, you all are coming up with some great, so such great responses. Good organization, that's a great one, Leah. So like a habit or disposition that, that the students would need to have. Christine had resiliency. That's an important one as well, thinking about the kind of habits, right? So yeah, these are great responses. So there's a lot of skills that students would need, database searching, right? Um, and citation tracing, how to do a citation, um, synthesizing sources, yes, absolutely. Organizing the massive number of cases is a challenge, yes. Good working memory, absolutely. Um, right, so they need a lot of skills. Um, 
but they also need a lot of habits, right? They would need, you know, resiliency and they would need patience um, and they would need persistence, right? Because we all know that searching is not a straightforward process where you put in a few search terms and you find exactly what you need and then you're done, right? There's a lot more that goes into it. There's a lot of, you know, approaches and mindset that we need to be successful with that. Um, and then there were lots of things that they would need to understand about information, detective work. Yeah, you have to be persistent. You have to be willing to try different things. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And then someone mentioned like scholarship as conversation. So there's things that they would need to understand about what the purpose of a literature review is. Right. And what are the underlying assumptions behind why we do literature reviews, such as recognizing this idea that scholarship is a conversation. Right. And so part of the literature review, what we're doing with the literature review is we're trying to make that conversation visible. We're trying to connect those sources, you know, to each other, put those sources in conversation with each other. So students would need to have that understanding. Right. So that's really what information literacy is. So those folks that might be a little less familiar with the term, it's this set of, of abilities and understandings that would allow students to be effective at, at assignments like literature reviews or other types of inquiry-based assignments where they need to find sources. So information literacy is a combination of, of skills that students would need to have, like database searching or citations, ability to critically read an article, uh, but it's also habits or dispositions that students would need to have, flexibility, adaptability, persistence, all of those. Um, and then it's these understandings, these core understandings that students would need to have about research and scholarship uh, that are sort of commonly shared among more experienced researchers. Uh, and I want to highlight uh, six core uh, information literacy understandings. Uh, some folks will be familiar with these already. These are from the Framework for Information Literacy for Higher Education. Um, but these are uh, six core information literacy understandings that are basically ways of thinking about research and scholarship that are broadly shared across experienced researchers. Uh, so this idea that research as is inquiry, this process of inquiry, right? So research is an ongoing and iterative process. It's really about answering questions across or between uh, disciplines or within a specific discipline. Um, and you develop an answer and that answer leads to new question, right? And then that leads directly into the next point of scholarship is conversation, right? So this recognition that scholars are always talking to each other through their work, they're always building on each other's work, right? Um, responding to previous research. And so you have this ongoing conversation among scholars in the field as they try to answer key questions in the field or solve key problems within the field. Right. Authority is constructed and contextual. So the understanding that certain types of sources are considered uh, more authoritative than others, um, and that context is key to determining what types of sources are going to be considered authoritative or not authoritative. Uh, searching as strategic exploration. So, you know, this idea uh, that you have to try multiple different search terms and search strategies. There's a range of different search resources. You can't do the same search every single time. You have to be willing to explore and try new things as part of the search process. Um, information creation as a process, this understanding that information is created through a range of different processes, um, has many different formats, and you need to understand sort of the complex interplay between format and uh, creation process and review process to understand how that source is going to be valued. And then the final one, information has value. So recognizing that information has a wide range of values some financial, some not. And that leads to a lot of restrictions and guidelines and requirements about how information can be used and accessed and shared. Um, so that's a really, really quick understanding of the uh, go overview of those four concepts. I do have some links in the chat for folks that uh, would like to learn more about those concepts. Uh, there's some resources there that'll be helpful to you. But I wanted to give us that background really quickly to just make sure that we're sort of all at least have that sort of basic understanding of information literacy. And the key point that I really want to hit here is that there are these shared understandings. If we think about information literacy as a discipline, there are things that that sort of experienced researchers know and understand about research, about scholarship um, that are shared, but that are often unspoken. Right. So we might actually tell students that the purpose of a literature review is to put the sources in conversation with each other because that's become natural to us. Right. That's become tacit to us. So one of the goals of the framework was really to try to highlight what are those shared understandings that sometimes we don't talk about 
but that really influence our expectations for how students are gonna perform when we give them any kind of research or inquiry-based assignment. So that's the point that I really wanted to highlight. Um, I'll pause there to see if there are any questions about information literacy really quickly, and then we'll jump into talking about uh, decoding the disciplines and connecting decoding the disciplines uh, to information literacy. But pause there for a few seconds to see if there are any questions or comments. All right, if any questions or comments do come up, please do go ahead and continue adding those to the chat and we will go ahead and move forward. Uh, so we're gonna talk in this section about the decoding the disciplines model. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you really quickly, uh, again, if you're comfortable sharing your response, how you would rate your familiarity with uh, the decoding the disciplines model. Uh, so I've given you some options up here from A, I could teach the model to someone else, uh, down to E, I am not familiar with the model at all. Um, and the few different ranges in between there, B, or you, could, you think you could apply it. C, you could probably explain at least the basics of it. D, you've heard of it, but you know haven't really done much with it. Uh, and then down to E. So please go ahead and share your response in the chat if you are comfortable. All right, so we've got uh, responses coming in. We've got E, D, D, E, E, D, E. Uh, lots of E's and D's. That seems to be the primary. A few C's, a few, uh, a few A's or B's in there. But it looks like from what I'm seeing that C, D, and E seem to be the most prominent responses. Uh, so folks that may have some familiarity with the model, but maybe not a lot of it or haven't really had a chance to apply it or think about how they can apply it to their work, uh, which is great. That is wonderful. Uh, that's what we're here to talk about today. For those folks that do have more experience with the model, uh, please feel free to share any insights. If you have, you, know, you actually use the model yourself, uh, love to hear about that as we're going along, uh, if it seems appropriate to, to uh, fill that in. All right. So uh, another quick sort of reflection thought experiment, experiment thinking about what we mean when we talk about decoding the disciplines. Um, so again, I know we have folks from a range of different backgrounds here. Um, so take a minute to just think about what the appropriate method of citation is for your discipline. Um, you know, if, if you're a librarian, you can think about, you know, as a librarian, what is the most appropriate citation method? Or you can think about a discipline that you work with heavily. Um, what is a recommended, recommended database for doing research in your discipline? Uh, what is a top at or one of the top journals in your discipline? Think about how easy or difficult it is to answer those questions uh, thinking about your own discipline. And then think about how easy or difficult it is to answer those questions if you had to do that in another discipline, right? Uh, and I had this experience myself recently um, I've mentioned uh, previously that I recently started a PhD program in the philosophy and history of education. Um, and so it's been a, an interesting experience for me going into a field where I had less familiarity with the disciplinary resources. Like I knew about Eric just from being a librarian for years, um, but thinking specifically about the philosophy and history of education, I was like, I have no idea what journals are prominent journals related to the philosophy and history of education. Absolutely no idea, no idea what conferences to go to, right? Um, and so I, I'm guessing that a lot of you would have said, in my own discipline, it's really easy to know, answer those questions, right? I know we use APA in this field. I know we use uh, Chicago style in this field. I know I would need to use ERIC or CINAHL or you know, American History and Life or whatever database it is in your field, right? And I know the journals in my field. But when asked to answer those questions about different disciplines, it gets a little bit more challenging. And it's not that you couldn't find out, it's not that you couldn't figure it out pretty easily, um, but it may not be something that comes to you right away. If you were asked, you know, what citation style they use in business and you're a historian, you may not know that way, right? Some of you that are librarians may have a little bit more expanded, uh, may be familiar with multiple disciplines at once. So, you know, may have a little bit more a background of different areas. Areas, which I think is a great role for librarians. In general, right, the, the key point is that there are things that we, we of course, 
It's APA is the citation file that we use. But when we have to step out of our disciplinary background, it becomes the, the key point in thinking about the decoding the disciplines model is that um, hopefully the internet will not, I got an internet unstable, hopefully. Um, so the, the key point is that, right, you have a lot of knowledge about information literacy in your, in general, right, just from your experience being a, a graduate student and now as a, as a librarian or as an instructor or whatever your role is in higher education, you have a lot of experience about research and information literacy and you have specific experience about research in, in, in your discipline, right? Um, and that information that you have can contribute to learning bottlenecks for students. Bottlenecks are those places where significant numbers of students might get stuck or they might struggle, right? Because your experience and your knowledge creates a gap, um, right? There's that gap between your experience and the novice learner. But because things have become so natural to you, uh, there may be things that we're not actually telling our students very explicitly um, that they need to know to be successful. And, you know, it's not that we're doing that. We're not being cruel to do that. It's just that we we don't even think about that because it's just become our natural experience. Um, this is how it works in this discipline. Okay. So that's really the key point, And that's really the purpose of the decoding the disciplines model is here's what we can do to start to decrease that gap between how an expert would do this and how a novice learner would do this. Uh, so this is a, a model that was developed by uh, Joan Middendorf and David Pace, uh, decoding the disciplines. And it's basically a seven step model that you can see here, this kind of seven step wheel uh, that gives instructors and librarians and folks that work with uh, students in a, a variety of different ways, a way of thinking about the expert knowledge that they have and how they can um, kind of cross the gap and start to give students the ability to, to, to cross that gap themselves. So how can we start to make explicit what we know that has become tacit to us um, and, so that students are able to master the tasks that we give them? So that's really the goal of the decoding the disciplines model narrowing that gap between the expert, how the expert would do this, and you know the, the knowledge that a novice learner has. So we're gonna talk through the different steps uh, of the model. We're not gonna spend a equal time on all parts, but we're gonna focus more heavily on the first four or five steps of the model. I did wanna highlight, just because I do know that we have a range of different folks here today. Um, if you're an instructor, um, I, I think that you can really use this model to identify learning bottlenecks that students might have uh, related to information literacy and develop strategies or practices uh, that you can use in your own classes with students to help them overcome those bottlenecks. Um, if you're a librarian, I think that you can use the model yourself, you know, as I know that many of you will have instructional responsibilities yourselves uh, and think about how you can use the model as a teacher, as an instructor to start narrowing that gap. But I think, uh, you know, if you're a librarian, you could also, this could be a model that you could talk about with the, the faculty that you're working with, uh, the instructors that you're working with in, your, in their areas to help them start to identify uh, some of that tacit knowledge that they have. Um, and if you're a graduate student, uh, hopefully that you will be able to use this model to start thinking yourself about some of the gaps that you might have about discipline, about research in your discipline and think about, okay, how I can, you can start to, to overcome those gaps yourself. All right, so the first step of the process is to identify a bottleneck. So again, a bottleneck is basically like a place in a course or in a series of courses uh, where we see significant numbers of students struggling, encountering obstacles, uh, not really able to meet the expectations, right? And we can, we can learn this in, in many different ways. If we taught the course a few times before, we might recognize, okay, this is that thing that students always struggle with. Um, you know, if you're a librarian, you might be, we, we constantly get this question at the reference desk, right? So where are those places in the course where students struggle? What are those bottlenecks uh, related to res the research process or, or information literacy? I wanted to highlight really quickly that bottlenecks can be cognitive or emotional. Uh, they can be things that students just don't know or don't know how to do, right? I don't know how to search a database. I don't know how to create a citation. You know, those can be bottlenecks, but it can also be emotional. It could be uh, about how they feel um, about the course. We know, um, you know, I know as a librarian that students can have very strong feelings about the research process. 
And a student can come in and say, you know, I've never been good at research. I hate doing research papers. I don't understand the purpose of research papers. And if they're coming in with that perspective, that's a, that's a bottleneck, right? That's going to be something that's going to prevent them from doing as well on the research assignment as they could. So I wanted to, to uh, have a chance to think more about what are some of the bottlenecks that we see. Uh, so I'll put this link in the chat there as well. So you should all see a link to a Jamboard uh, in there. Uh, and so the question I wanted to, to get your all's thoughts are uh, thinking about research, thinking about information literacy, what is an example of a bottleneck that you have seen in your students? Um, another way to think about this question is what are the what is an example of the way that students consistently fail to meet your expectations? when it comes to research assignments. I want to mention really quickly that I know that that is very deficit-focused language. I don't like to use deficit-focused language, but for the purposes of this activity, uh, it's kind of the best way to phrase it. But um, so I just wanted to mention that. But so please, uh, we're going to go ahead and go out to that Jamboard. Uh, if you haven't uh, posted a response to a Jamboard before, hopefully everyone is seeing the Jamboard. If you're not, please let me know. The easiest way to post a response is to go over on the left-hand side. You'll see an option to add a sticky note. Uh, so you can add your sticky note there and, and go ahead and post your response. Um, so our question is, uh, what are examples of research or information literacy uh, related learning bottlenecks that you have seen in your students? And feel free to, as folks are doing, feel free to, to, to move your responses around. They all pop in in the same spot. So sometimes they like pile up on top of each other. Um, all right, so uh, some of the responses, I can kind of already see some themes coming in. So we see several responses around uh, research topics and research questions. So students have trouble narrowing their topic down. They have trouble identifying an appropriate topic, identifying, developing an appropriate research question. Um, I definitely think that is a really key learning bottleneck. I think that developing a research question is one of the hardest things that we ask students to do. Um, and that can be a real bottleneck. If they, from the beginning, are not able to identify an appropriate research question, they're not gonna be able to be successful right in the rest of the assignment, for sure. Uh, so lots of stuff around identifying research questions and narrowing down their topic. Um, I see some responses here around the types of sources that they're using. Uh, so knowing what scholarly sources look like or knowing how to identify sources that are relevant. Um, right. So identifying qualitative research studies versus quantitative research studies. Um, so evaluating sources for quality and appropriate. Yeah, so several responses in that theme as well, that source evaluation and source selection is something that students trouble with, finding credible sources, finding the appropriate types of sources for their particular information need, you know, finding those scholarly sources when that's a requirement. Um, see responses around citations, what need, you know, what citations need to be, what the point of citation is, yes citations, especially how and why. So lots of cha challenges I'm seeing, you know, around tying, uh, around the point of citations. I see some around synthesizing material, right? So students may be able to, you know, maybe they're able to find material, but they can't actually bring it together. They don't know how to synthesize and pull that material together to make any kind of sense of it. Um, not being familiar with what library resources are, uh, how to pursue, yeah, so that sort of barrier of that, they, they don't really understand the library, they don't understand library research, they think someone had, you know, that they can do all their research using Google Scholar, yeah, right, so thank you, yeah, so these are all great examples of bottlenecks uh, that students might experience related to research, so, and, you know, they can come in all different parts of the research process, from the beginning of not being able to identify an appropriate topic, not being able to find sources, not being able to bring those sources together, not knowing how to cite those sources or why they need to cite those sources. Yeah, great. Thank you all so much for sharing your response there. Those are great examples of bottlenecks. So you may wanna think about one as we're going forward, think about one of these bottlenecks specifically. And as we're going through, think about how you might approach that bottleneck um, using the decoding model um, as we're going forward.
we'll go ahead and go back to our slideshow here. Oops. All right. Hopefully everyone's seeing the slides. Again, if you're not seeing what, um, what I'm saying you're seeing, please do let me know. Uh, so the first step then is uncovering that, identifying that bottleneck. The second step of the decoding the disciplines process is to think really carefully about the mental tasks behind those bottlenecks. So if the challenge is that students aren't able to develop a, a good research question, this is where we start thinking about, well, how do experts develop their research question? What are the steps that an expert takes to develop a research question, right? How does an expert know what an appropriate research question in their field is? Right. If the challenge is that students aren't citing their sources, right? How how does how do the experts in the field cite the source? How do they know how to cite those sources? You know, what kinds of knowledge are you drawing on that would allow you to do this this process? So when you think about that bottleneck and identify that bottleneck, then you start to break it down even further. What are the steps that I do as an expert that allows me to do this thing? Um, what are the things that I know? already as an expert that allows me to be successful at this task. I mean, think about the, the research question example, right? Uh, an expert in the field has the built-in advantages that they're familiar with the conversations that have been taking place in the field, right? So that they already have that, that background knowledge of these are the kinds of questions that scholars in my field talk about, right? And oftentimes they're building on previous research questions that they have themselves have had asked. Uh, so that kind of gives gives you as an expert a built-in advantage to be able to develop a good research question, whereas students may be coming from the, the perspective of they don't even know what a good research question in general looks like, much less what a good research question is in your particular discipline. Uh, so step two, uncover the mental task. Uh, step three is then to model those tasks, right? So once you've identified the steps that you take as an expert that allow you to be able to do this and the knowledge that you're relying on as an expert that allows you to be able to do this, then we have to share this knowledge with our students, right? Um, so perform the type of thinking that we want them to demonstrate for them. Make explicit those connections between the key concepts, uh, the like the information literacy concepts, concepts that are underlying what we are doing, right? So we have to let let our students see us doing the task, see us doing the work, and explaining this is my this is how I would approach this, right? So you know if you you know want students to find a scholarly article, uh, you know taking that time to say okay as you know you know a researcher in this field here's how I would go about doing this. I would start by going to this particular database. And these are the kinds of search terms that I would enter, right? So that you're modeling um, and replicating that kind of task for them so that they can see how you would do it as an expert. So that's step three. Step four is uh, giving practice and feedback, right? So these, these skills and these understandings that we want students to develop, these are difficult for students to develop. Um, and they need a lot of practice in being able to develop these skills, especially in low stakes environments, right? So multiple times where they can practice developing their research question um, before they have to turn in that final research question. Uh, multiple times where they can practice, you know, citing their sources before they have to turn in that final bibliography. Um, so giving those students multiple chances to practice and get feedback. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like, a, you know, a big grade, right? Low stakes is really important, um, you know, and you might be thinking, this is going to be so much grading for me. Uh, you know, there are ways that you can, can give the entire group feedback um, without having to grade, you know, hundreds of individual assignments. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. But, you know, any way that you can give students multiple chances to practice the skills that you want them to demonstrate. Um, motivate and lessen resistance. So this is where we think uh, specifically about those emotional bottlenecks that students might be experiencing. What are the, the motivational issues? What is preventing them from, um, you know, even wanting to try this assignment? Um, what, you know, how might their feelings about research assignments be um, creating a barrier for them? Um, so thinking about what those motivational, those motivational issues might be, those emotional bottlenecks might be, and how we can kind of talk about those and address those. And then the last couple of steps, um, 
you know, thinking about, okay, here's, uh, uh, you know, here's the process that we've been following. I'm going to assess whether or not students actually seem to, to get what I've been trying to teach them. Um, and then, you know, if not, we can try something new. Um, but we're going to have that continual process of assessment. And then the last stage in their model is sharing with others, right? Here's what I found so far. And then kind of going back and starting the process again. Um, and it's important to, to keep in mind, right, that that no, there's no expectation that you're going to address every single bottleneck that students experience in one time. That's just not possible. But think about what is the, the most important bottlenecks that, are, that are, are preventing students from being successful? What's one that I can start to address right away, right? And then we can go back and we can try a different bottleneck. Um, but no one's expecting that you're going to be able to, in one class or one session, right, be able to address any all the bottlenecks that students might be experiencing. Um, so that's why it's a wheel that continues to go around. All right, so we'll pause there to see if folks have questions about the decoding model um, or any ideas as we've gone through this for opportunities for how you might uh, begin to implement this into your work. Uh, so you can feel free to share your responses in the chat if you'd like. If someone uh, would like to uh, you know, raise your hand and unmute, you can do that as well. Pause here for questions, comments, thoughts. I told you we all you're going to be seeing a lot of cat pictures there. I had co-pilot being creating creating a lot of images. So. Uh, uh, Christine shared. Um, because we uh, mostly provide one shots, I'm thinking of a libguide content or posters or social media posts that address a bottleneck. Yes, absolutely, right? Um, think about, you know, a, a, as librarians, right? We see a lot of those misconceptions that students have, those misunderstandings or that gap that they might experience. What are we ways that we can start to explicitly address some of those? And, you know, it could be through that one shot session, but it could be, you know, through other resources that we can provide uh, to students. Absolutely. Uh, Sarah said, I think it's a great model and so important to not assume that students know what we know. Um, I'm nervous about effectively identifying bottlenecks, though. That's great. Uh, great, Sarah. And we talk a little bit about a few kinds of activities that might help you to be able uh, to identify bottlenecks. So I'm going to share a few of those and hopefully those will be helpful um, to, uh, to address that issue. Uh, all right. So I wanted to really quickly take us through uh, an IL bottleneck and kind of show what this process might look like as we're going through. Um, that shared, I like this model. It formalizes something I've been thinking about, uh, which is really getting specific and explaining the why of things that seem fundamental and how students seem to benefit from that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that today. Because I think that's that's really key. And that was something that the framework really tried to emphasize as well for librarians, my brilliant, right? The why of the issue, right? Why is it so important that students cite their sources? Why is it important to, you know, you know, to put the the, the sources in, a, in conversation with each other? You know, what are the expectations that we have that maybe we're just not talking about with students um, or we're trying to, but we, we didn't have the language before to talk about it with them? Uh, the model has me thinking about how we can share uh, that it's a lot to learn how to search in the library resources and it will take time for them to practice. Yes, absolutely. And that's one of the things you can share too. You can share your, uh, you know, share those examples of, of challenges that you had as a student. Um, and, you know, so that students know that it's not just them. I think one of the, one of the key things is that a student can really feel like I'm the only one that doesn't get this, right? And we know that's not the case. And so if we address some of these things explicitly, they're going to realize, hey, I'm not the only one who struggles to identify a research question. I'm not the only one who struggles with citing sources. Um, so I, I really think that that's one of the benefits of this model as well. You know, you will have students, you'll have students with a range of different abilities, and some students may not need that extra help, but you're going to have a lot of students that will. Um, and you're going to help a lot of students if we, if we really explicitly clarify some of these things for our students. Right, so let's walk through really quickly a bottleneck. 
Um, so one of the bottlenecks that some folks mentioned, of course, in the, the responses as well is around citing sources. So students are not providing the appropriate citations for their sources. Maybe it's that some they're using the wrong citation style. You wanted them to use APA and they're using MLA. Uh, maybe some are just providing links and they're not providing any information at all. Or maybe they're providing a citation, but it's for the wrong kind of source. So they're, you know, it, you can't tell if it's a journal or a book because they don't, they don't know themselves, right? Um, so, you know, what's an example of either a cognitive or an emotional bottleneck that might be contributing to this challenge? So what are the things that an expert might know um, or might understand that a novice learner might not? Uh, so if you have any thoughts there, uh, share your response in the chat. What is something that could be contributing to this challenge for students? Uh, cognitive, emotional, you can also, if someone would like to raise your hand, you can do that as well. Um, what do we think of could be contributing to, to this issue? Purpose of citing. Yes, Jerry, absolutely. They may just not be, you know, have that understanding of why citation is, what are we, what are we intending to do when we cite our sources, right? Um, they don't understand why we cite things, right? Um, they don't understand that there are standard formats for citations. Yes, Brooke shared, understanding that citation styles vary. Absolutely, right? They may have been taught to use MLA and they may not be aware that there are other citation styles. Yes, um, emotional, absolutely. There's a lot of fear around plagiarism and citations. I absolutely, completely agree, Laura. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that uh, for sure. Uh, frustration about how tedious citing is, absolutely. Um, I know I've had to sometimes convert a paper from APA to Chicago style and just wanted to like tear my hair out. It was so annoying. Um, professionals have seen a lot of models for written research while an undergrad may not have any idea what a finished product should look like. Yes, absolutely, right? We've seen, we've read articles, um, you know, we're familiar with articles in our discipline, but we've probably read scholarly articles in other disciplines as well. So we've seen the differences. Yeah. Um, Yes, they see and hear people uh, stating things as fact without citing a source. Yes. So they, they in their experience, right, in a lot of other cases, people aren't required to cite sources. So why in, in this situation is there so much of an emphasis on it? Yeah, these are all such great examples. Um, so I, I highlighted a few here, and these are the same ones that you all have shared. They've gotten by before by not citing things. Yep, absolutely. Right. So as folks mentioned, they may not be familiar with the citation style for that particular discipline. They may not be aware that there are multiple citation styles. Um, they may not know how to identify different source types. So they don't know how to use the citation guides because they can't tell the difference between a journal article and a book and a, a, you know, a website because everything looks like an article or a website to students online. Um, and then as folks feel, there'd be a lot of emotional bottlenecks around citations, a lot of anxiety, They've been, you know, they think about citation as a very punitive process, that if I don't get this right, I'm going to be punished, I'm going to be reported for plagiarism, and it creates that anxiety, creates that fear. Um, and then several folks mentioned they just may not really understand why, the why of citation. Why is this so important? Absolutely. Um, and they may not know that citation guides exist. Absolutely. I think that's a really important point as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So. We went through that first step and we identified some of the potential, uh, we identified a bottleneck and some of the potential things that be, could be contributing to that bottleneck, right? So then this is when we start to move into that second step where we think about, okay, in my field, what, what are the expectations for citations? Um, you know, how did I, how did I learn how to, I, how to do this? You know, what are the resources that I relied on? What are the resources that I rely on myself to cite sources? I don't expect that students are going to be citing every source by hand. I don't. So what are the sources that I use to find the citations for the sources that I'm needing, right? Um, and then how does an experienced researcher think about the purpose of citations, right? Why citations are so valuable. Um, what, are, what are some of the concepts that we talked about from the framework that would, could help students to understand why citation is valuable? Anyone have any thoughts on that? The, the core information literacy concepts that we can start to talk about with students that would help them to think about why citation is value, valuable. Information has value, absolutely.
giving credit to people. Authority, yep, shows the credibility, yes. Scholarship as conversation, that one is a key one as well, absolutely. Um, right, showing credibility of your work, giving credibility to other people, right? intellectual merit, yeah, absolutely, right? So, you know, um, technology barriers, that is an important one as well, yes. Something like doing a hanging end indent or italicizing things, yeah. Um, and you know that's that's on the one hand you're like okay that's a that's a little thing, but if you know that your instructor is going to take points off if you don't have that hanging indent right that can create frustration for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, thinking about sort of the core understandings that are relevant to this kind of uh, and folks mentioned these thinking about the framework two concepts that are really important to this I think are the idea that information has value thinking about all the ways that information has value to the researcher, to the author, to the audience, um, and how that uh, influences our understanding of why it's important to provide appropriate citations. We know that it's an important to a scholar for their work to be cited, that that's going to enhance their reputation if they are, they are cited, right? So um, we know that it has a lot of different types of value. And we also understand this idea of scholarship as this ongoing conversation. And we recognize that citations are the record of that conversation. That's how we navigate the conversation is through citations. And if we're missing those citations, then, right, um, you know, if, so if we don't have that understanding of this ongoing conversation, we may not recognize why citations are so important, right? And then this is where we could model the task, right? So we give students those explicit resources. Here's a citation guide that you can use, right? Here's the, explicitly tell them what citation style you want them to use. Right. Um, provide them an example with reference pages from articles in your field. As someone mentioned in the chat, they may not have really seen a lot of scholarly literature. So show them the reference pages, right, from articles in your field. Um, show them how you go about creating citations. And if that's, I use the cite, by, the cite feature on Google Scholar, because that's primarily what I do. Like I make corrections if they're needed. But I would rather my students turn me in, you know, citations from um, cite it, from, from Google Scholar that may have a little bit of, you know, incorrect than, you know, struggling for hours to try to create them all by themselves by hand and getting really frustrated, right? So if, if you use citation tools, I think it's totally fine to tell students about them as well, right? And then you can explicitly discuss things like scholarship as conversation or information has value. So they do start to get to that why, uh, why we think citations are so important. Right. Uh, here's an example of an activity that I've done with students before to get to that. Uh, so sharing an article with them in which all of the citations have been redacted. Um, and I just did that with uh, Adobe Acrobat has a really quick uh, redaction feature that you can use. Um, and then having them talk about what are we missing now that we don't have these citations? What does that mean for the value of this to us? Right. Uh, and so I think, you know, this is a quick you know activity, but I think it's fun that you can do, but it does start to get to that, that thing of, okay, I can't find the background of any of information, this information. I don't know where to go to check if this is actually accurate or not. I don't know where to go to find more information because I don't have any of these references, All right? So that can help them start to see why we think citations are so valuable, All right? And then there's a few other kind of citation activities that I wanted to share here. You know, you could provide low stake citation act activities uh, where they talk through the process of how they find a site, uh, how they create a citation. Um, and, you know, you can kind of give them feedback. I, an activity that I've done that goes back to the point that someone made about how it can create a lot of fear, right? I've done this kind of fears and frustrations activity where I let students just get those frustrations out, create a, a video or a PowerPoint or a poem or whatever they want to create about how they feel about citations. And they feel very strongly strongly about citations, right? And then we can talk about what's behind those, those fears and frustrations and, you know, hopefully start to turn their thinking around that this is not a punitive, not, not intended to be this primarily punitive process, but this is the value of citations. All right, so I know we're gonna run out of time. Uh, quick, any questions, comments, thoughts that folks have, but that I just wanted to walk us through uh, a, a quick sort of decoding and a, a bottleneck and sort of how I might approach that. Um, for the last part, really quickly, just to make sure we're able to cover everything really quickly, just wanted to share a few quick uh, recommendations or activities. Um, if you're an instructor, if you're creating your own assignments, I highly recommend that you actually do your assignments, 
right? And that doesn't mean you have to write an entire paper, but think about here's what I'm asking students to do and step-by-step, step, here's how I would do this. Here's the database that I would go to, here's the journals that I would use, here's the citation style that I would use, and then check to see whether that is reflected in the assignment description. And if it's not reflected in the assignment description, you know, add that in, add that additional detail in so that they, you know, they have that information. Just so that you're making sure yourself that it's, you know, that you're not skipping providing them information just because it's become so natural to you that you expect, uh, that, you, that you assume that they already know that. Um, another great way to do this is to get some, get a colleague to look at your assignment, hopefully one in a different discipline, right? And have them interrogate your assignment, right? Have them identify vocabulary that you use that may be confusing. So they could ask you like, what do you mean when you tell them to use a primary source? What do you mean when you tell them to use a high quality source or a scholarly source? Those are the kind of questions that they can ask you. Um, you, you told them to um, use library databases, but you didn't tell them which ones to use, right? And there's hundreds of different databases. So they can give you feedback for, on your assignment from a different perspective. Uh, you can also do this with students themselves. I do this, uh, what we call the interpreting of research assignment activity. Basically, we give the assignment to the students and they go through the assignment and give feedback directly to you. Here, I don't understand what this word means. Right. Um, I'm not sure what you uh, where I would go to get started with this assignment. Um, I don't know what's really important about the, the criteria, the grade, you know, what's going to be the most important. So having them annotate and evaluate that assignment. And I have questions there that you can use to guide them through the process of annotating that assignment. And that gives you that feedback right away. Here's more. Here's where I need to provide them with more information. Right. Identifying bottlenecks. So someone had mentioned in the chat, I don't know how to identify bottlenecks. Uh, I, I, I've mentioned these so many times in the past before it's like a broken record, but simple activities like a true false activity can be really helpful for identifying some of the misconceptions that students might have, right? So you could do, if they're doing a literature review assignment, do a few true false questions about what the purpose of a literature review assignment is. And that can get you some feedback. Oh, maybe they, they're not really familiar with the term literature, in the scholarly perspective, they were thinking about novels. That could be one particular thing that you might find out. But quick activities like this can help you start to identify, oh, here's kind of a misconception that they have, or here's a gap in their knowledge that they have that I might want to address. Uh, same with self-explaining activities, just having them tell you what they would do, um, right, out loud. Here's how I would go about evaluating this source. Here's how we go about citing this source. And you can hear, okay, that's where they, they are going wrong by having them tell you that. Um, small practice, lots of things that you can do in the last five minutes of class to have students practice the skills that they need. So if they have to find three articles for an annotated bibliography at the end of class, five minutes, have them find one scholarly article and send that to you. And you can take a look and see, okay, it looks like 20% uh, of them sent me sources that are not scholarly articles at all. So maybe I need to talk a little bit more about what scholarly articles are, right? Um, so using those last five minutes of class or those first five minutes of class to get some feedback on the specific tasks that you're asking them to do as part of the assignment. Um, and then for the last couple of slides, I just, I highlighted a few different bottlenecks and shared some activities related to those. So if the, the bottleneck is just understanding the purpose of research assignment, here's some different activities that you might be able to do where they think about and define what the purpose of research is. Uh, here's some activities related to evaluating sources, if that's the bottleneck that they might have. Um, identifying authoritative sources in the field. This is a great activity where they go out and highlight the different types of sources that are in a reference list uh, so they can see 90% of the articles in this reference list are journal articles, you know, that kind of uh, background. Uh, TILT is a great uh, model, transparency in learning and teaching, just thinking about being very clear with our purpose, task, and criteria um, as we're sharing those with students. And then I just have a bunch of resources available for everyone. So all kinds of different resources here on teaching framework concepts, teaching research and information literacy, uh, some decoding resources. I want to make sure everyone has access to those. I did want to highlight really quickly, uh, especially for o Ohio State uh, affiliated folks, we do have in the library a lot of pre-made Canvas modules uh, on a range of different topics, such as citation, citation tracing, evaluating sources. These can be downloaded into a course and 
revised as needed, but they're pre-made, ready to go modules that you can use with students. Uh, so we just wanted to highlight those as a resource that is available. All right, so I know we're at the end of our time. Um, questions, comments, that thoughts that folks have on decoding, uh, action steps, key takeaways that you would like to share. Um, I'd love to hear any of that uh, from everyone. I'm going to stop sharing and just kind of open it up to any uh, questions, comments, thoughts that folks would like to share. Thank you all so much.